independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Thrilled to be here. Not thrilled for the first topic of the show. Uh, the first conversation. It's all about the vaccine. It's all about COVID-19. It's about the rising cases. All that stuff uh, is all over the place. I thought this was an interesting starting point, though. Uh, ABC News, its political director, Rick Klein, uh, was talking about how confusing all the messaging has been uh, over the weekend. This is true. Everyone and anyone you ask, no matter what side of the conversation you're on, should be able to admit that messaging in and of itself uh, has been very, very confusing, uh, to say the very least. Let's start there. Where you need national unity or some consensus about what kind of signs, what kind of signals you're going to follow. And you really have the opposite. And look, you can blame the virus for being confusing and for adjusting. Yep. But at this stage, you don't have a reservoir of goodwill that the Biden administration has been able to build up because there's been co conflicting information. There's been conflicting advice. The science has been changing. We don't know what zone we're living in or what the mandate's going to be for indoors versus outdoors, vaccinated, unvaccinated. People want their lives back. And Joe Biden told us just a few weeks ago, told the American people that we were about there. We were getting our lives back. Now we're seeing this backslide. We're seeing his uh, his advice adjusting. And, and it is confusing. <laughs> we're seeing his advice adjusting, uh, something he had told us just recently as well, the president, uh, that we would not have to put masks back on. We would not have to uh, do certain things if you were vaccinated. And I know that this conversation also turns into uh, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated and what's the right approach in that world. I saw a lot of coverage, actually, of that uh, conversation this weekend on the Talking Heads. I do want to play this audio, though. It's Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's talking about the efficacy of the vaccine. And again, it, I'm not doing this with an agenda. I'm not trying to, to push you one direction or another direction in the world of making your own personal decision. I just think this matters when we talk more about reinstituting re mask mandates or, or considering other potential things that we we have to still listen to what the science currently is uh, instead of just make it up as we go uh, because that's what everyone says right they say they all follow the science politicians don't don't do this on their own uh, they just ask a a doctor they ask someone in the medical community that is there influencing them in a room to do a certain thing well this is the current thought process on the vaccine, on the Delta variant, on all of it, according to just a day or so ago from a prominent doctor. We know that there's more people with this Delta variant who've been vaccinated who are probably spreading the infection, but it's still a very small percentage of people who are becoming infected after vaccination and who then are going on to spread the infection to others. Um, remember, the original premise behind these vaccines were that they would substantially reduce the risk of death and severe disease and hospitalization. And that was the data that came out of the initial clinical trials. That premise is still fully intact. We still see that these vaccines are doing a very good job preventing symptomatic disease, preventing hospitalization and death. The second premise around these vaccines is that they would reduce the incidence of infection, any infection, including asymptomatic infection, and they can also reduce the risk of transmission. And therefore, they would be an important public health tool in effectively ending the epidemic, the pandemic, because they would prevent people from transmitting the virus. That premise is still intact, but what we see with the Delta variant is it's diminished. That's it. That's the science of it right now. There is, I guess, some consensus opinion emerging that the Delta variant is more uh, potentially capable of, of the things as stated by Dr. Gottlieb than other variants of the virus were for vaccinated people. That means getting someone infected at all. I know that Dr. Fauci said last week that the amount of infection in some of the vaccinated people was the same as unvaccinated people. But the vaccine does still work. And the again, the reason to say that is not necessarily to impose my opinion or bias on anyone else, uh, whatever that may be. It's actually to say that these mask mandates, these other, other decisions, seem utterly, utterly wrong. They seem confusing. They seem to be designed for something else. Uh, and I know I hate my tinfoil hat version of a conversation on this, but I can't get away from it. I can't get away from the idea that if the science is essentially the same, maybe slightly different, but not any kind of uh, major risk version of change in the world of what we believe to be true as far as the vaccine is concerned, then why the change in mask mandates? Why D.C. is my favorite, actually. If we if we touch on D.C. for just a second, 
Uh, there's so many fun things in the world of politicians, uh, mask mandates, and and Washington D.C. Uh, because the mayor there decides to go ahead and reinstitute a mask mandate right after throwing a birthday bash. So so part of my favorite uh, aspect of all this is the fact that there's a birthday bash at all. Then you impose a mask mandate. Then you're captured on camera again without a mask on in a large group of people. I guess uh, another wedding or something took place there, and Mayor Bowser did not have the mask on uh, again, which is tremendously, tremendously amusing. And then CNN is the most (laughs) open-minded station in the world on just this one topic. I love the way they excuse the behavior, uh, John Berman and Brianna Thompson. I love this so much. I have to play it because it's where everything is so biased. Everybody is so ridiculous in the way in which they, they communicate and speak about any of these points because it's so subjective. It's so pick and choose your own adventure. Here we support. Here we, we ridicule and go after. Uh, but just listen to the way they excuse behavior that is actually not following a mandate that a bunch of people in D.C. don't want to follow and a bunch of other people thought probably was a good idea. Uh, But here are the elites just living different lives again. And then CNN being essentially their their propaganda machine. She wasn't actually, as far as we know, violating the new rules, correct? I think that that is fair to say, but I think (laughs) it it might also be about is she violating the spirit of it? I don't know. What do you think? I get it. Well, you know, it's, it's hard for me to remember what we're all supposed to be angry about, because it wasn't that long ago we were criticizing politicians for where I love, I love the what aboutism here. here. You're going to immediately bleed into, well, I don't even know if we can get mad at someone for instituting a mask mandate, then taking their mask off somewhere in this country, because we were just getting mad at everybody that was wearing masks when they shouldn't have, uh, you know, so I'm just going to deflect and change the conversation and not answer the question at all. For wearing masks still where the science was telling them, Oh, They didn't need to be. You know, we kept on asking the White House, why is Joe Biden still wearing a mask when the mask guidance, you know, has changed? And now, of course, we're saying she should be wearing a mask, even though she was still (laughs) following the guidance. Look, she wasn't. She wasn't following the guidance. I love this fact, this excuse. I love this version of coverage. And I know this is not shocking to most people who listen to this show or shows just like this is is the idea that CNN is biased. But it's just so amusing to find it in such an open way that they're talking about someone who reinstituted a mask mandate somewhere in our country, the mayor of of Washington, D.C., and then after that chooses to go to a party with a lot of... Actually, you know what's even better is the Obama birthday party that's coming up. This is another of my favorite stories that emerged over the weekend. Uh, Former President Barack Obama is planning a birthday party for himself. He's turning 60. Uh, It's going to be a fairly big event, as uh, we are told, 475 confirmed guests or something to that extent, Uh, and they're all going to be vaccinated, I'm sure, or all going to be tested or something or whatever it is, Uh, but this is obviously okay. Anyone you ask in the world of CNN will probably defend this, but then if a Republican were to throw probably a party with more than three people at it, the exact opposite conversation uh, would occur. So it's just so amusing to me that this forgiveness mindset exists in some ways, because I do, to, to back up again, just one second on this, I guess, or whatever it is, and then we're going to take a break. Um, The vaccine conversation is incredibly nuanced, right? You have people that believe in getting a vaccine, uh, people that think it's right and and a good thing to do. You got Dr. Fauci out there saying that that everybody has to do it for for the other man. This is something you do for others, not yourself, uh, which has been his, his rhetoric on this for a while. And then you have people who don't believe in it, aren't scared of coronavirus, young people, uh, people that might be motivated by all kinds of things, not just politics, to not want to get a vaccine. Uh, and essentially, one side of that conversation is trying to force their opinion on the other side of the conversation. And they're saying they're doing it because of public health. Uh, but to be America, to be the United States that we all know and and love, we we can't actually force that opinion on those that have some uh, having a different opinion and choose not to do that. You can't actually do that. I know businesses can. I know certain, you know, communities can do some things uh, that are a little bit different than what I'm saying here. I mean, politics. I mean, our country and our government. Uh, We just have to live in the world we're in because our country is better for the policies that exist that in this one situation may be making some people in this country very, very mad. It's still overall uh, a better world to live than the other places 
uh, in the world that do very different things. And I even checked the vaccination rates of all the countries in the world. I was just curious. I was like, all right, the narrative in the United States is that a bunch of Americans are, are being dumb and, you know, uh, they're doing it for political reasons because they're brainwashed by some Republican. And is that true in other countries? And no one has, uh, except maybe for some very small countries, a hugely different fully vaccinated percentage than the United States. Places like Canada might be almost 10 percent higher than us, which is a lot that's significant. But it's not like we're at 50 and everybody else around the world's at 100. If you look at it and there's a bunch of, of states or a bunch, excuse me, countries uh, that are very well developed that also do not have a higher rate than us, that have a lower rate. So it's it's not just a problem here, and it's one that might be more about human condition and way less about politics and whatnot uh, that exists in the world. All right, I got to take a break. A lot more. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Chad Benson Show, where we reach across the aisle and occasionally poke someone in the eye. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. I can't get away from the coronavirus vaccine conversation, mass conversation uh, this morning. At least I can't. Although I did see that uh, one out of nine people hate Mondays. Uh, That's just a a thing. uh, And I don't think it's surprising at all. One in nine in a recent survey in the United States said that they dread Monday every Monday. They don't care. Uh, and I'm going to try to make uh, this Monday as, as dread-free as possible. Uh, the vaccine conversation now in the world of the government also focuses a lot on young people and getting young people vaccinated that feel as though maybe they're not necessarily at risk, uh, which is not wrong per se. Uh, there is a lot of data out there in the world of science that says young people are at less risk than uh, you know people in different generations, older generations, Uh, There's a lot of different data out there. But apparently, in order to do this, the government is going to get a bunch of influencers, a bunch of social media stars to tout the vaccine. And this is just out there. The New York Times and other places reported on this. Uh, They even used the example of a 17-year-old girl who had 10 million followers on TikTok and was recently discussing the vaccine and how great it was, I guess. And the uh, administration, of course, did pick uh, Olivia Rodrigo, who's a, a... actual famous person. And I guess that's unfair. Uh, but for some reason, the influencers seem to have a different type of fame, uh, a much less controlled type of fame. Actually, if you're someone who's gone viral to the degree of having 10 million followers on a social media platform, you might not have hired anybody that you might not have a team. It still might just be you and a cell phone uh, doing something that now is making you a lot of money, uh, which is true. And so it is weird to me to think that maybe there would be a PR company and others involved and a high-profile celebrity being asked for help like this, and in order for it to to not necessarily be those type of people they reach out to, but these these younger influencer types, uh, that they're going to do it a different way. Um, and I don't know how we go from here. It's just interesting to me that this part of the conversation is one that's neglected a lot, and the solution right now is is almost borderline creepy in a way to to connect with a bunch of younger and in some places, in some situations, kids and try to get them to help out with your vaccine uh, conversation. 62% of people in a relationship with someone say they have someone else on standby, quote-unquote, just in case. And that's almost two-thirds of long-term relationships, apparently. I don't think this was specific to you know married or dating people. I think that it was probably predominantly people who were dating, I, I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, but this is an interesting recent survey from Study Finds. 54% of women and 44% of men say that they've reconnected, I'll say it that way, with an ex, uh, someone that, you know, you've moved on, but not entirely as well. And so that is, I guess, the most likely relationship to be just sitting on the back burner. It's such a weird story to me. And I guess this also isn't terribly shocking uh, to discuss. I don't know uh, how many people feel as though that's, that's too high a percentage, uh, but we live in a weird world, man. Uh, we do. We live in a world where we have the the vaccine thing I'm just talking about, and you're asking 16 and 17 year old kids to use their 10 million followers on social media to get a message out for the government, however important or valuable you think that message is. And then you have such a connected society 
that two out of three people admit that even though they're in a committed relationship, they uh, they have a replacement ready to go. It's It feels like sports. To me, that feels more like having a minor league system for a baseball team and not the world we all live in. Uh, another survey, I'm interested in a lot of these this morning, found that people now see showers as more relaxing than baths. This is something that has changed during the time of the pandemic. 41% of people say they prefer a shower, 32 so they prefer a bath. This was in the context of what helps you relax, not just get clean. And my biggest, re- it's not in here, it's not in the study, uh, but my biggest kind of like uh, uh, reaction to that whole idea is maybe people are more grossed out by germs now. Maybe the bath has taken a hit, an odd hit in all of this, because people are like, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to uh, clean myself that way or, or <laughs> sit in my own my own filth, as some people describe it, because... Now that there's so much more focus on public health, I think this is probably something I won't do. I I guess my hot take on this, too, is I still find a bath to be relaxing, and I do it boy bath style. I have a boat. Don't worry. There's only a few bubbles. But uh, I I thought this was tremendously funny. 20% weren't sure. Uh, When asked the question, what is more relaxing to you, a bath or a shower, 20% of people got confused, which also makes me laugh, in all honesty, because I think we're in such a weird place that that percentage of people make sense to not be able to make up their mind on pretty much anything. I feel like for every survey moving forward now, especially with the confusion that's been the last 18 months, that if you ask somebody a question about anything, 20% of people are going to be like, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not really. I'm not positive. I'm going to have to get back to you after I do some Googling and check in on all the talking heads because I really have no idea uh, how to lean one way or the other. Uh, But I do very much like that. Uh, One other quick story here, and I'm sure... Uh, my producer is happy this will have to be quick. Uh, there's a new contraceptive out there to help men, I guess, if that's a thing you're looking for. It involves magnets, and the magnets are attempting to shrink things. That's all I'll say about it. I'm not promoting it. I'm surprised it's out there. Quick break, a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad will be back tomorrow. Uh, Two other quick pieces of audio I already have to get to uh, from Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, The first one is good news, I guess, for anybody that feels uh, that there is still good news possible out there in the world with everything going on. Uh, He was asked if uh, this was on ABC this this week. He was asked if uh, he thought that the the lockdowns and those things were coming back. He said no. Uh, John, I don't think we're going to see lockdowns. I think we have enough of the percentage of people in the country, not enough to crush the outbreak, but I believe enough to not allow us to get into the situation we were in last winter. I feel like that's good news. I feel like even if you're a Dr. Fauci saying that you don't think we're ever going to get beyond the mask mandate part, uh, which I should say, and I know a lot of people have probably had this conversation uh, over the weekend with with other people that they know and care about, is that, that that feels like the line in the sand for some. But for a lot of people, this is a this is a hurdle that that's not the end of the world. Uh, people will, in some places, I actually saw a lot of social media people saying they were putting masks back on, even if it wasn't required to them. And I know we all have thoughts about that uh, one way or another. But it seems that the mask hurdle is probably an easier one for us to go back and forth on than any other potential hurdle, and certainly more so than a lockdown. Fauci also went on to talk about how if you're not vaccinated, you're doing something that's not fair to the people around you. This is a more controversial point, to say the very least, but here we go, Dr. Fauci. And there are things that have to do with you individually which also impact others. And get the spread of infection that we're seeing now, the surge in cases, John, is impacting everyone in the country. So although you want to respect a person's individual right, 
when you're dealing with a public health situation. And we are, in fact, in a very serious public health challenge here with a pandemic, with a virus that has an extraordinary capability of spreading rapidly and efficiently from person to person. I got to be honest, when he touches on you want to be uh, respectful of someone's decisions, you want to give them this freedom. That that feels scary. That that feels like we're touching on some tough topics, some conversations that that go into that other world, that world that so many of us don't want to argue about, maybe, uh, and that world where what is correct as far as freedom goes for people to make their own decision versus uh, the conversations that are had often by people like Dr. Fauci, politicians and whatnot about this this very pandemic that just won't go away. I so thought we were on the other side. And then this conversation and spiking cases in some places has made this the overall focus of conversation everywhere over the weekend, except for maybe the Matt Damon thing. I want to touch on the Matt Damon thing quickly. And if you don't know what the Matt Damon thing is, awesome, because uh, there is a part of this kind of celebrity conversation, world news stuff that it's probably if we all just skipped a lot of these stories, it's probably better. This one harder to skip, I'm sure, than most uh, because it involves him using a word that a lot of people would say is is not OK in 2021. A word that is a homophobic slur. It is the the F word of homophobic slurs. Uh, and I guess Matt Damon had recently told a joke to his daughter. Uh, this is all a, a conversation he had. What's interesting about this, by the way. He gave an interview. In the interview, he talked about how he needs to not talk so much. He needs to be quiet and listen more, which is a very common thing. I think a lot of people say it now to to appeal to the woke crowd is, oh, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to listen. And everybody gets happy when they hear that. In the same interview, he volunteered this story that was not being asked. It's not like the person interviewing him said, what's something you've done that probably would con- be considered bad? to a lot of people recently it's it's not it just it just came up in casual conversation with the sunday times uh he said that he used that word recently maybe a few months ago in front of one of his daughters uh he has three daughters by the way that are 15 12 and 10 that daughter then uh wrote him a a lengthy essay on why it's terrible to use that word and changed his mind he said he is now retired and he understood Uh, He also said in the conversation that when he was growing up, that word kind of meant a different thing to him. It didn't necessarily intend to offend or or demean, belittle, whatever uh, it does uh, to to any group in our country, any any uh, group of people. It, It wasn't essentially an attack on gay people is what he felt growing up and where he grew up in the on the East Coast. Uh, in Boston, uh, I think that area, I guess this was, and I will be honest about this. I grew up in in New Jersey, and uh, that was also a phrase that was commonly used when I was a kid. That that was something you said, and I've I've heard comedians <laughs> joke about this before. None of this is a defense, by the way. It's just demonstrating the truth in that part of the the sentence. But man, oh man, was this story all over the place. The fact that a huge celebrity admitted to something that in 2021 is absolutely thought of to be an appropriate, controversial and whatnot. Um, and I, again, I'm not saying that uh, because I'm trying to defend it either. I want to make sure to be abundantly clear here. I don't, I don't use the word myself as an adult uh, because I do connect it to some of these things that are being said in this story. But it, it's just so unique in the different ways to try to navigate this conversation. And more importantly, and I guess this is a better macro question in the world of celebrity interview, uh, he chose to be candid and honest about something that is absolutely going to hurt him. Um, and that conversation, that kind of candidness is probably just not a good move for famous celebrity people and not at all comparing it. I want to make sure that this is abundantly clear because I feel like if out of context, someone said radio host somewhere in the world compared these two things that I can get in trouble for that. So this is not a comparison at all, uh, but uh, playing off of my own point and saying that Matt Damon volunteered information that is going to be a politic a, a PR nightmare for him in some way, shape, or form. I think that was part of the conversation around the Simone Biles uh, stepping out of the Olympics because of mental health. She volunteered information that didn't have to be provided to the world. Uh, obviously, she was praised uh, by a lot of places for being a hero. Uh, that is absolutely the language and the wording uh, chosen. She volunteered this information. 
about something that she was struggling with, something that is not controversial anywhere near. Again, I am not comparing the two things per se. I'm just saying, and it caused a little bit of a, of a backlash in, a, in some circles and in certain places as far as questioning Simone Biles and, and her status as an elite athlete if she couldn't compete in the Olympics because she couldn't get over a mental hurdle that I think in some way, shape, or form exists for most elite athletes. It's probably not exactly the same and certainly not in the year in which we've all had, uh, but that is absolutely something that became part of the conversation. In a very different way, a celebrity actor chose to offer a, a situation in where he was not living up to the, the expectation of many of our time, our current society, and he is going to be mercilessly taken down. I, it's all over every social media, every uh, big you know celebrity news gossip site and a lot of legitimate news sites. Uh, that Matt Damon just volunteered this conversation uh, during an interview he gave recently. So there you go. Another weird thing in the world. All right, let's shift gears very far from those things uh, to save us as much as possible. A gas station in Canada accidentally put diesel in with its regular gas and didn't notice for an entire weekend. A bunch of people are now having issues with their cars and are intended to sue uh, that, that establishment. I don't know how you mix this up. Uh, the gas station said that they had a fuel delivery last week. And they got tanks that went into the wrong, the wrong places as far as refilling them. Uh, they pumped regular gas into the tanks that was supposed to hold diesel and vice versa. So they, they mixed up everything. People who needed regular got 20% diesel. And people who expected diesel got as much, much as 40% regular gas. It's not clear how many customers have been affected so far. One person said that their truck is just done. It just is. Uh, it's not going to be a car that moves anymore. And it's going to cost that person $8,500 to fix it, uh, I would be livid if this happened to me, especially thinking about all the ways in which our economy is just punching us in the, I'm going to go with stomach because the other word I wanted to choose wouldn't be okay, but punching us in the stomach all the time. Uh, there's so many things that cost an insane amount of money right now, including gas prices being way over the top, that if this happened, like you would be so angry at all involved in this process. I, I don't know. I would just drive there or, well, I guess walk if the car wouldn't work and demand money there probably would not go well. This is a moment where I'd get confrontational. I said that I would not uh, be confrontational in a lot of these debates we have every day. If somebody pumped the wrong gas into my car, I would be an upset human being to say the very least. Uh, and I don't know what the exact rules are, what's going to happen as far as recovering costs uh, in Canada. But I, I know that maybe that, that gas station probably isn't going to have the funds to fix all the cars they potentially broke. Uh, one other quick story, and then we'll take a break. America has weighed in on who their next Jeopardy host should be. I guess after a recent survey, recent requests for reaction from people who've seen uh, about 10 different fill-in hosts, maybe a few more. Ken Jennings, 23% of people think he should be the next host of, of Jeopardy. He is the famous contestant from the show. Uh, they feel that if it's not him, then maybe the former executive producer, probably current executive producer, Mike Richards, Stepping up would make sense. And then the, the celebrity name outside of the world of Jeopardy that popped up on this list, LeVar Burton, number three at 10%. I, I don't know who to vote for here. I didn't watch a lot of the Jeopardy fill-ins. I just love that LeVar Burton is still out there doing stuff because uh, I definitely remember the reading rainbow. And I could see him doing it. He could be great at Jeopardy for sure. All right, I got to take a break. A lot more coming up. This is Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. No need to socially distance while listening to your Chad Benson Show podcast. Four out of five experts say so. I'm a scientist. There is no corona. But hurry before they change their mind. You know they will. Chad's podcast found on iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite COVID-free podcasts. Oh my gosh. <gasps> I kind of like it. I'm not going to lie. This is the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Thrilled to be here. Uh, there is viral video of a mass of people at the border uh, trying to pass from the popular Rio Grande crossing area. Uh, Bill Malusian from Fox News has been covering this probably more than anybody else. And it's been very interesting, the coverage. Uh, but he's the one to tweet it out. I think this was just yesterday. A huge, huge influx of migrants 
at the border. It looks like over a thousand people in a certain area of it. Uh, this is a conversation that continues to just get mostly ignored, uh, not necessarily just by media, but by certainly by the current administration. I don't know what the the plan solution is. And this is another great example of we're worried about something in some contexts, but then we talk about it in a different context. And because of whatever reason, we're going to pretend it's not worrisome anymore. Uh, what I mean by that is you talk about the coronavirus and all the upticks in cases everywhere, uh, places like Texas and Florida in the news for seeing rises in cases. And certainly, obviously, those places were in the news for some of the things they were putting in place as far as restrictions or lack thereof at other times. And then you have this conversation, a lot of people crossing the border every single day where their vaccine status and other things is tremendously unknown. Uh, You're not really sure of a lot of that stuff. And for the most part, the solution right now is to release these people into the country uh, and to ask for them to report back at some point uh, something they, they very rarely do. So it's very interesting to see that this continues and the viral uh, tweet out there. So I would go look for that if I were you and you have interest in that kind of thing. Jessica Alba opened up about a relationship with her husband, Cash Warren. This was during an interview on a podcast that I think uh, one of the Schwarzenegger kids, the the daughter of Arnold Schwarzenegger runs before, during, and after baby, I think is the name of the show. You know, I, I love the fact that there's a crap ton of different places out there to to go get a fix of whatever you want. Uh, but what's more important or amusing about it, and I'm obviously partial to you listening to this, as is Chad Benson, I think it's a very smart move, the listening habits anyone who's hearing me right now have chosen to make. Uh, but what's interesting is there's so many different things out there and so many friends of celebrities that are doing a thing that every so often you have this news go viral because somebody says something in one of these podcasts and doesn't realize just how quickly it can it can kind of go this far. Uh, but Jessica Alba said that she became more like a roommate to her, her significant other. She said it's all rosy for the first two and a half years in a marriage. Uh, but then after that, you become more like roommates. You're just going through the motion, she added. You have the responsibilities. It's a lot of like check the boxes, uh, she said as well on this podcast. Alba also opened up about how easy it is to take your partner for granted, uh, which is very interesting. You have like obviously the friendship. I'm quoting her again. The comfort of like you're not going anywhere. And so sometimes you don't treat that person the best. Uh, this all came up in the podcast and the conversation which I found tremendously, tremendously interesting. And a lot of people would say that if you're married to, to Jessica Alba, it'd be, it'd be hard to, to envision that world where you just treat each other like roommates. I think a lot of people would wonder if they could get there as well. Uh, but it's just an interesting thing to throw out there. And certainly during the time of the, the pandemic and quarantine and all that stuff that I can't seem to get away from today, I know that probably the dynamic in some relationships got more like this um, or maybe something else uh, much scarier or something else bad could have been happening in some of those situations, but this is probably the better of the end results uh, for anyone that, that navigated the, the lockdown stuff and spending more time with loved ones in a, in a struggle at all. Uh, A lot of people didn't struggle by the way, but I just found this tremendously interesting released out into the world that she kind of sort of was having relationship problems with her current husband, uh, Cash Warren and she articulated it in an odd way, <laughs> to say the very least. And she talked about it on a podcast with a buddy. And now it's all over there. It's getting covered a lot, at least enough for me to talk about it here. National Ice Cream Sandwich Day is today. I am always amused at the different national holidays. The fact that almost none of them seem to have any genesis of any kind. They just, they just happen. Someone wakes up somewhere and tweets out that it's a day. And then other people start to agree with that tweet. And then eventually it's officially a day. Uh, But today is National Ice Cream Sandwich Day. So the question was asked, 30,000 Americans answered, do you eat ice cream all year round or only when it's hot? Only in the summer. 68% of people said they eat ice cream all year round. 17% said they only eat it when it's warm. And 3% only eat ice cream when it's cold outside. I don't understand those three. I don't know what that means. Maybe they're just stuck in places where it's always cold. Because I know that that's being the that is a reaction that other people are having on social media to this, and maybe maybe that's just because you know it doesn't warm up in certain spots and people don't want to not have ice cream. Uh, but I definitely eat it all year round. Maybe this is another. And I know our current president Biden eats it. Very big fan. Uh, but I, I maybe this is another thing that we can help fix people. You know, we can we can help get a little bit further down the road of of unity and happiness. Uh, just treat your. It doesn't have to be ice cream. Just treat yourself to something. 
and don't make it just during the hot seasons. If you like ice cream, have it uh, all year round. Uh, and if you, you know, love ice cream, I guess, I don't know. Uh, but the president, of course, has uh, things to say about that topic as well. I just thought it was so interesting that today is another silly holiday uh, somehow that someone out there just decided. I really want to know how that works. I think we need to get some sort of national holiday expert to explain the the full details. Do they share? Do the businesses all ask each other? You know, like the the big corporation things uh, that exist in the world. The the I, is big ice cream a thing? And did it lobby for a specific day? And I don't think many Americans celebrate it. I I, I don't know if we're trying to create a Valentine's Day for every industry so that people blow up different things the same way they buy cards and things. I don't get it. I don't understand it all. Uh, but it's certainly something that's out there in the world. And I, I really need someone to explain it to me um, as soon as, as humanly possible, because I would be much happier in this world if I understood it much better. All right, I got to take a break. A lot more coming up. This is Greg Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. This is The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad will be back tomorrow. Lots and lots to talk about. Stop the insanity. That's the plea from a lot of parents to uh, their school systems, to the CDC, to anybody who will listen as far as the mask mandate goes in schools. Uh, They're begging for people to reconsider the idea uh, the CDC certainly in their own uh, their own educational boards or whoever they need to to hear the message uh, because the the mask in school conversation has some unique aspects to it. I mean, first and foremost, I guess uh, you should say for anyone that thinks this is the right thing to do that a lot of kids still can't get a vaccine at all. So if you're someone that believes in the vaccine, and I say it that way every time because it, there's a lot of people that don't apparently. Uh, But if you're someone that wants the vaccine for you and your family, uh, then you certainly can feel a stress in in not having it and having maybe kids go back to school. The same is true, I think, uh, for other parents who don't have any intention of getting their kid vaccinated, that they're now dealing with this argument through their children. And that, to me, is as intriguing as anything else, right? And also just the mentality of the child. So you have two things kind of going on uh, that cause this to be about a lot more than just the science. And I know we always struggle in those conversations. When something goes beyond the science, a lot of people put their fingers in their ears and just stop listening. Uh, But you have kids that are going to school afraid, I think. I think it makes rational sense, depending on the age of the child, to be more or less afraid, or maybe not all that afraid, depending on the kid, I guess. And then probably not wearing the mask terribly well. Because you have either or, right? If the kids are worried about their own health and that, that message has been... Uh, drilled into them a lot and certainly would by the actions of telling them they have to put a mask on to go back to school, then that kid probably is going to wear the mask well for starters, of course, but at the same token, probably not be in the best mental place to learn things because they're probably stressed. The other kid, the kid who's not afraid because his parents told him that he didn't need to be afraid uh, or however he got there or she got there is probably not going to do a lot to keep the mask on. I, I think that that's tremendously interesting too, right? Uh, because essentially, when we talk about that conversation about mask mandates and whatnot in, in the world of school, we then assume the children will do it right. And if they don't, let's say your kid is one of those kids who, because his family or he or she, whoever, I don't know, uh, just isn't all that afraid and doesn't wear the mask well every day, they're going to get yelled at by the teacher a lot, especially if the teacher is someone who's much more fearful, because uh, those, those emotions are going to come out. In this conversation, they come out at Target when adults are talking to other adults, and that's just going to make the learning environment even worse. I think when we we put these rules and these expectations in place, we underestimate the mental side, especially when it comes to a child. And, and I think that we need to start addressing that conversation. I think that's why so many parents are begging 
for this to be reconsidered in one way or another because uh, that stress is something that is is very difficult for everybody to manage. And when you do dive into some of the data on this stuff, and I will play this audio of Dr. Scott Gottlieb, uh, we are finding out that the science has not transformed tremendously, that for the most part, uh, the beliefs are still the same. And I know, again, in the world's, world of kids, the vaccine isn't really part of the argument right now, uh, but this would be an argument for a teacher, say, who's fearful of going back to class, who might be fully vaccinated and might not have any pre-existing conditions or any other reasons to be overly concerned for their health. They might feel better hearing this and knowing that in this world, it's, it's you know, more and more likely that you, you will be just fine. Uh, and so I think that that is why the conversation always becomes for people who are and aren't vaccinated, the risks are different. If you are vaccinated, you're not at risk of getting hurt by someone who isn't. And that is always kind of neglected in so much of this. But let's play the audio. This is Dr. Gottlieb on the vaccine. We know that there's more people with this Delta variant who've been vaccinated who are probably spreading the infection. But it's still a very small percentage of people who are becoming infected after vaccination and who then are going on to spread the infection to others. Um, remember, the original premise behind these vaccines were that they would substantially reduce the risk of death and severe disease and hospitalization. And that was the data that came out of the initial clinical trials. That premise is still fully intact. We still see that these vaccines are doing a very good job preventing symptomatic disease, preventing hospitalization and death. The second premise around these vaccines is that they would reduce the incidence of infection, any infection, including asymptomatic infection, and they can also reduce the risk of transmission. And therefore, they would be an important public health tool in effectively ending the epidemic, the pandemic, because they would prevent people from transmitting the virus. That premise is still intact, but what we see with the Delta variant is it's diminished. Um, there is more evidence that people are likely to spread the Delta variant even after vaccination than they were likely to spread the other variants but it's still a very small percentage of people it's still a very small percentage of people is a sentence that most are just going to throw out in that whole equation most are going to hear hear him say that all right it's it's had an uptick all right it's all different now all right the world's ending essentially again uh, and that that is not the truth uh, in other news i saw this story out of texas a six flags in texas six flags fiesta fiesta uh, will have the the steepest drop roller coaster in the world, or, or at least here in the United States, I think, coming in 2022. Uh, it is a 90-degree drop, essentially, <laughs> which is which is fantastic. Uh, it is something that is supposed to be very uh, fear-inducing, I guess, in a lot of ways. It's 60 miles per hour, 95-degree drop at one point. Uh, the machine travels 2,501 feet on track through a, a different inversion, G-loop kind of stuff. I love so many of the words in this. 270-degree, zero-G roll a 75-foot near-vertical drop. I don't know what excited me so much about the idea of a fancy new roller coaster, and I promise I'm not just doing a commercial for them, uh, but maybe that would be such a great way to just cleanse the brain, if this is something you like, of all the, the crap that we've dealt with, all the stress that we've dealt with. Just pop on a brand-new terrifying roller coaster for the 20 seconds or however long it takes to go through it. Uh, it's called the Cliffhanger, by the way, I believe. Uh, Dr. Diabolical's cliffhanger, excuse me, much more important that we uh, use the good doctor's name there. Uh, and it would be a good way. I, we all have to find something. There's got to be something we can do. Maybe it's not roller coaster for you, but to just uh, remove so much of the negativity that's been in our brains for so long and is creeping back in now that we're all dealing with this this conversation again uh, because of the Delta variant and because of, of people just getting mad at other people. And, and I do still believe that to be the case, that a large majority of this ever-shifting message to, to the American people, the you should wear, you shouldn't wear a mask, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, is designed to find a way to get more people vaccinated, more so than to continue to follow science. And because of that, we have a problem where people have to fight each other now. Uh, and I just don't know how you eventually get past that world that it seems like the, the government specifically is throwing us in, but we're, we're stuck there. Tesla's autopilot saved a person's life. The person was drunk driving, so I'm not really uh, thrilled at the idea that the reason that the person needed to be saved was, was some mistake they made on their own. But it is, it is a cool story. Uh, we see these stories all the time of the autopilot feature on Tesla uh, not doing what it's supposed to do or maybe someone utilizing it in a way that's bad uh, where they're, they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing, like reading a book in the back of the car. And I guess this is true too. But a guy over the weekend, 24 years old, 
was out drinking, uh, drove himself home and passed out behind the wheel, and the autopilot system kicked on and got the guy to safety. Uh, it is kind of incredible. According to uh, one of the websites, 8% of of Norway. This is where it occurred. Annual fatal crashes involve drunk drivers. So this is something that's a bit of a problem in our country, of course, but in other places. Uh, but this guy, you know, just, I, I don't know if it's a good lesson too, by the way. I don't know if I, I should even promote this because I, I don't think that's how he should plan to get home next time you're out drinking. But it is a very, very interesting story to say the very least that he was was just fine. And, and honestly, and again, this isn't a commercial for Tesla per se, most of the stories I see that involve the headline Tesla autopilot usually end fairly badly. High coffee consumption is linked to small brain volume. New research shows this doesn't mean that you're you're not smart. This doesn't mean that it impacts your intelligence at all. And just apparently, if you use a lot of coffee, your brain might shrink in size. Uh, researchers from the University of South or South Australia have found that caffeine is associated with brain volume, and also actually there is a, a negative, a higher risk potentially of dementia. Uh, they assessed 17,702 participants aged 37 to 73, looked at how often they consumed caffeine and coffee, and then, uh, you know, kind of figured out that the most concerning data was a 53% increase in the risk of dementia. I've said this before about some stories like this uh, during the time we're all living right now. I can't handle any more bad news. I just I just can't. If if coffee is something that's hurting me, it's something I need. It's something that I can't live without. So you just got to give me that one world. And I, I don't think that anyone should put down the cup if you're having a cup of coffee. It's just, uh, it's an interesting article to be out there right now. And one that's making a little bit of rounds, uh, some places that they studied a bunch of people and they said, yes, the brain volume <laughs> shrinks a bit. Again, that sounds worse than it is. And then also potentially you have risks of, of some illness. Uh, but I just, I just don't need it. You could save it. I think we save all of these stories that are of the most pressing concern science. I think you stop studying negative things for a little bit of time. Give us all a break, or at least just don't put it out there. Maybe this is my fault, though, because I did just talk about it on a fairly big radio platform. So that's this is on me. I apologize. I'll do better. Quick break. A lot more. Uh, this is Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. Get over it. It's time to forge a new path with your very own political cartographer, Chad. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. I saw an article in the New York Post about how to be a, a better employee, how to get ahead in the world of, of uh, your, your work world, your work life. And I thought some of the advice was fairly interesting. Uh, one of the bigger things in the headline of the article was to not be a one-job kind of person, be a jack-of-all-trades kind of human, learn a bunch of skills, I guess be good at a lot of things, but a master of none, uh, essentially. I don't think I agree with that advice at all, <laughs> but the advice out there was interesting. It said whether or not you pick up multiple jobs so that maybe you're not focusing on just one career path, and maybe this is for younger professionals, uh, that you would be able to learn enough skills to be better at a lot of things as you get older, uh, which gives you a lot more options in life. It also said that in work at certain places of employment, you should try to get as many different types of jobs in that office as possible, work in as many different of the areas of the company as possible uh, to get more of an understanding of the company one, but also improve your chance of advancement. That that seems better on paper to me than the idea of just uh, you know working a whole bunch of different jobs at the same time. But even that, I don't know if that's really necessarily the best path. Only 35% of respondents said that they plan to stick uh, at their career though. So really, I guess this is sort of a, a focus on getting you to develop and stay with one. Cause that's something that nobody does at all anymore. To be honest, you don't really early on in your professional career land at the company you're going to work at for the entirety of your life. It's just not a thing you do. I work in a radio group uh, outside of this uh, job that I fill in for, but I work in a radio group that has a lot of people who've been at the career a long time in the building that they've been in. And there's a lot of radio groups that don't have uh, that same, that's a, it's an odd industry in that way. Uh, but even in seeing that, you talk about how often it's no longer the case in so many other fields, not just this one, 
uh, that it becomes more and more confusing. Moving on, there is a man that got his coronavirus shot in Mexico. The audio has gone viral, though. I don't know if the guy was was not really into the idea. I don't think this was forced on him. I do do think he he chose to go get his shot. Uh, but the guy was at least tremendously afraid of needles. He screams quite a bit, so much so that the place that's giving out the vaccines, all the other people eventually break into applause. Uh, I don't know. At most places, if you're at a hospital or something, you're sitting in the waiting room and you hear someone screaming in terror. It probably makes you a little bit more fearful of what's about to happen to you. This was not the case for the other people here waiting for their COVID-19 vaccine shot. Uh, but here's what it sounds like when one guy is not ready for what is being asked to him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end. Yay, you did it. You got it done. Um, I don't know. I For the people who are not getting a vaccine because they might be this fearful of it, I, I guess there should be some of us that have a little bit more empathy for this guy. But it, it is, there's a lot. It's that last part. It's the mumbled words coming out with the screaming. He's okay, by the way. Totally fine. Uh, now very happy that I think he went and got the vaccine. So, of course, there, I think, a little bit better of a world. Uh, this story amused me a lot today, actually, just shifting gears to something that's definitely a more of an off-the-beaten-path conversation. A husband rushed back into a restaurant to mistakenly complain after he was he accused a sandwich store of calling his wife a bad word. The fast food restaurant and coffee shop has been dealing with a lot of different complaints, as have most people a lot of places, they said. But this happened in South Carolina. Uh, the owner and a few other people had acknowledged that this was just a misunderstanding. Uh, but a guy by the name of Robert Wilson Barnes and his wife took their sandwich out of a bag after leaving a Jimmy John's and were stunned to see what appeared to be the word with a B, starting with it, written on the packaging. So they, they essentially thought that someone labeled their order with the B word, uh, they rushed in, they asked what had happened, and it was just that it was a person with bad handwriting. It was actually written to be BLT, as in bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwich, so identifying the sandwich and not something that would be much more offensive to people. Uh, this viral post on social media has gotten hundreds of thousands of reactions, comments. Uh, people have said all kinds of things to it. But the dude does burst in the doors of the Jimmy John's. He does look at all the sandwich artists or whatever they're called now, and does start to yell at them for calling his wife a mean word. And they had to, like, look at the packaging together to see what it actually was that was written on it. They're like, sir, we're, this is a... I don't know how you recover publicly if you're this guy from that. I don't think he did it well. I don't know what a, a smooth way to be like, oh, this is my fault. My mistake there, kind sir. She did order the BLT. I will see you guys later. But it does also demonstrate that heightened sense of sense uh, of stress I think we all have in so many different ways. In so many situations, because if you look at it and the photo is up on social media, it doesn't really look like the mean word they thought that she was getting told, uh, in my opinion. It just does say BLT on it. And then there is a space and there is the, the letter CH, but that's just because of the size of the sandwich, uh, too, I guess. So so if you go look at the photo and maybe I'll put it up on some social media pages, Facebook.com slash Greg Collins show. I guess you might feel it's clip, but it's not. To me, it's pretty obvious that it's different, and this husband was just defending his wife's honor. Quick break, a lot more. Greg Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Thrilled to be here with you. Chad is back tomorrow. Let's get to Dr. Anthony Fauci.
Dr. Anthony Fauci said a couple things recently, as recently as yesterday. The first one, I think, is actually kind of exciting. Uh, should be kind of, uh, you know, a happier thing said out there at a time when we're getting very little good news. Uh, Dr. Fauci was asked if he saw lockdowns as something that would potentially be in our future. A lot of people probably find the question itself laughable and think, of course not, that's never going to happen again. But we're starting to see restrictions creep back up and cases, of course, of coronavirus creep back up. So I was happy to hear this answer. Uh, John, I don't think we're going to see lockdowns. I think we have enough of the percentage of people in the country, not enough to crush the outbreak, but I believe enough to not allow us to get into the situation we were in last winter. I want to just dovetail off of that by saying we have a solution in general uh, that exists for those that that want it. There is a solution out there that seems to uh, be backed by a lot of science saying that it's it's working. And again, I'm not trying to have an agenda in saying that. I'm just stating that it's different than last time when the governments of the world or the governments of our country thought it was OK to lock things down. The excuse was there was no solution. Now there is one. Uh, the other reaction from Dr. Fauci, this one more about the Delta variant and the vaccine and whatnot as well. Less uplifting, to say the very least. And there are things that have to do with you individually, which also impact others. And get w the spread of infection that we're seeing now, the surge in cases, John, is impacting everyone in the country. So although you want to respect a person's individual right, when you're dealing with a public health situation, and we are, in fact, in a very serious public health challenge here with a pandemic, with a virus that has an extraordinary capability of spreading rapidly and efficiently from person to person. So a person's individual, individual decision to not wear a mask not only impacts them, because if they get infected, <laughs> even though they say it's my decision. OK, look, here's the problem with this argument. And I laugh at the tail end of it because there's no other way to react to that. The the mixed messaging conversation. And I actually have audio that proves that as well. And and another uh, person out there in the world saying on national television that it's been confusing and saying it on ABC, a place that doesn't always, uh, I think, report. I think it's a pretty fair location for news. But at the same time, I think they don't always report some of the cons in these conversations uh, the way that they should. But it, it's just so intriguing to hear Dr. Fauci say, no, no, lockdowns aren't going to be a thing. And then you have to do what's right for other people and go get vaccinated because it's not fair. Um, and the science has not tremendously changed. I just want to reiterate again on our belief that people who are vaccinated are, are safe from serious illness and or death with the coronavirus, even the Delta variant. So it does feel as though the choice is more the people who haven't. And there, there are exceptions to that. I know that there are conversations about those who can't get vaccinated uh, and how fair or unfair it would be to them. And I, I can understand all sides of that argument, and that conversation. And I, I would not want to be in that situation to have to deal with that, and navigate that. But masks are still a thing that that some of us can choose to wear for all kinds of reasons. And how safe we are about going out of our house is something that some of us can still choose to do. Another uh, news shifting gears hard here. Simone Biles will return to the Olympics and compete in the beam final event after her health, her mental health concerns. Uh, the U.S. gymnastics uh, organization tweeted this out. They said, we are excited to confirm that you will see two U.S. athletes in the balance beam final. That would be Soon Lee, who is the one winning. Uh, she won a gold medal, a silver medal, and a bronze medal, I believe, uh, in the events that Simone had dropped out of. And Simone Biles can't wait to watch you both, it said. Biles had pulled out of pretty much every other event that she was in. And look, I made this argument before about Simone Biles, and I've even heard from a couple people, people that I know and people that listen to the, the show uh, and people that wanted to reach me in social media. By the way, Facebook.com slash Craig Collins Show. You can find me, Chad Benson, available on all the social media platforms out there. Uh, but they said that my take even was unfair, and I thought it was interesting because I, I feel as though, as far as the, the takes I've heard on Simone Biles, that I'm shooting more for the center of all this uh, than some other takes I've heard. And, and essentially what I, what I think to be true is that she is afraid or was afraid of losing in some of the things she was competing in. And that's not a knock on that person. I think that every elite athlete, every athlete that's uh, going to make history struggles with that at some point. You know, a really good documentary. Well, okay. I just called it a documentary. It's not that. A really good movie 
And then there is also a documentary about it, but I'm going to recommend the the movie version of it is 61. Uh, it's about Roger Maris breaking Babe Ruth's home run record and how hard that was on him mentally. This is an elite athlete. This is in the you know a time when everybody still remembered and cared way more, maybe still does, about the Babe. Uh, and Roger Maris was an athlete that people thought didn't really deserve to be the home run leader for a regular season, and he was chasing 61 home runs. It's a great movie. It's it's made by Billy Crystal, uh, but it, it demonstrates the mental stress that would go into not just competing at the highest of levels in different athletic events, but then trying to be a record setter, trying to do something that's never been done before. So for that reason, I understood, however difficult it would be to actually see it play out and to want to have the success for the the country and the success for the individual, Simone Biles not being, you know, ready for to compete in those events, that that could mentally make sense. I understood the the logic of all this, but it, it can be simplified down to a fear of losing. And I always thought that the best advice to give to Simone would be something, some fancy version of it's okay to lose. And now, obviously, a lot of those records are off the table. She needed to win multiple golds in order to be the most awarded Olympian and in her sport, and so she will not be, uh, but she will compete in one of the events. She had something that a lot of people call twisties, uh, which is, I guess, when you get into the air, depending on what event you're participating in in the, in the gymnastic world, and you don't really know where you are because of that mental block, you could wind up getting hurt. I Again, I'm, I'm not saying... Maybe the best way to articulate this is if I were her father, if I was Simone's dad, And my daughter told me, my 24-year-old daughter, who's a famous Olympian, who's won multiple gold medals at the Olympics in the past, had told me that she's not mentally ready or capable of competing and stuff. I'd have empathy and compassion for her. But there would be that part deep down, that part in, I think, all dads that would try to still get their kid to overcome that challenge to be a part of whatever sport they had dedicated their life to. That is, there is that other part. It's that deep gut reaction to try to say it's it's all right. And so I'm glad that she's going to compete in the, in an event. The Beams is probably an event that sounds as though it's less likely for her to get hurt than in any of the other kind of launch you in the air type of things they do in the world of gymnastics. And if she wins a gold in this, I don't know what the end narrative will be for the Olympian, uh, for the individual. If she winds up being awarded a medal of any kind, I don't know if that'll be considered a success or not. Uh, but I am glad to see, honestly glad to see, that she'll compete in something. Uh, Another story that's making the rounds all over is a local reporter who didn't see a truck sink in a lake behind him. I love this story in a lot of ways. Uh, This guy is is reporting outside of Lake Springfield. His name is Jacob Emerson. He's looking straight into a camera talking last week. And, and, you know, I guess the the coverage was somehow kind of connected to things there, although it wasn't supposed to be a breaking news story. And while he's talking, a, a... truck comes out of nowhere and sinks into the lake and the the other people on the team the other people have to point it out to him uh there was nobody in the car by the way i guess it was completely empty and i don't know if someone was just trying to dispose of it at the worst of times uh but it's definitely video that i recommend you watch and go look up on social media if you haven't seen it because it is incredible to see someone on television completely unaware of news that is actually happening directly behind their face and person it there's something funny about it a reason i connected so much to it is the idea that so many young people stare down at their phones all the time and just pay attention to nothing and this is kind of a unfair demonstration of that same thing it's not what this kid was doing he was obviously uh you know doing a live shot for news and so it's not this but it, it just feels like an example of that kind of thing i feel like this would be the cutaway scene in any kind of TV show that makes fun of people for having short attention spans. And it's it's real. It's a real actual thing that happened uh, out there in the world that has definitely made me laugh multiple times. If you need to pick me up, go look up this guy and see the video of Jacob Emerson reporting while a truck is disposed of or something happened, I'm not really sure, directly behind him. Uh, this is not news exactly well done. And I don't know if this is a... I, I would assume you get called in for one meeting with the bosses after this uh, at your, your news team. And you're like, Hey man, you're doing a great job out there. Just make sure to look behind you every so often in case there's breaking news directly behind you. while on TV, a uh, quick break, a lot more. This is Greg Collins filling in on the Chad Benson show. I'm 
If you're part of the politically exhausted majority, don't fear. Your time to be validated and rejuvenated is here. Wake up. It's the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. I saw this story making the rounds some places. A Vietnamese woman was wrongly uh, wrongly assumed that two people, and I think these were two American tourists, uh, did not speak the language. Uh, she was caught on video saying, and it's in a foreign language, so I won't play it, uh, that if these two foreign guys have COVID, we're all going to die. This is real video. It's online on social media making the rounds because I think one of the two people involved might have been a quote-unquote influencer. I think it's also uh, was first put up on Reddit. Uh, so the person seems to be getting agitated by some American-looking uh, tourists into her area. And she says, look at this, these two idiots, if this happens, we're going to die. Not only were the guys fully vaccinated, wearing masks, but apparently they both, they, they both also spoke Vietnamese. Uh, so they, they turned to her and started to say, Hey, um, we understand what you're saying. And here's the reasons why you probably don't need to be concerned. And she continued to kind of be dismissive, I guess, uh, in the video, which I've, I've seen and try to understand as best I can. And then eventually one of the guys goes, yeah, are you embarrassed yet? Are do you apologetic at all? And the answer is no. I just thought it was such an interesting representation again, and, and a very unique circumstance of it, of the way in which so many of us just interact. Now, obviously, because this woman was, was in maybe her own country and thought that the people didn't speak her own language, she said something out loud very brazenly as opposed to, I think, how a lot of us who, when we see each other with differing opinions in this world, uh, and, you know, we assume that we all do speak the same language, we don't say things out loud. But I imagine she's not alone, at least in the thought process behind identifying and seeing. What's interesting to me about it, though, she made the judgment solely based on where the guys were from, not how they were behaving, because she had her mask around her neck, but they were wearing theirs and also perceiving what she had said. Uh, the Queen of England recently told a story about how she likes to travel uh, for holiday. Sometimes she goes to uh, the Balmoral Castle, I guess. Uh, she travels there. And one time while she was going to Scotland uh, to, to you know, vacation, I guess she ran into a group of American tourists. And I thought it was a pretty cool thing that she had told. I think it was the mirror. The American tourists did not recognize her. Maybe she was in some kind of disguise. Maybe this is something the queen does. Or maybe it's the best example yet that Americans only care so much about British royalty. There's a, You only care so much. So these are Americans in the UK talking to the queen of England and not realizing it, according to this story. And they ask her if she's ever met the queen. And then the queen of England goes, no, I've never met the queen, but this police officer has and points to one of her security staff. And then they thank her for her time. And they did ask her if she's from around there. And she goes, I'm not, I'm not too far away. I live in a house not too far. It's kind of fantastic. And uh, I wonder sometimes when we talk about those things here, when we talk about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and all of those conversations here, just how much we really care. And uh, there's no better demonstration than this story that maybe it's nowhere near as much as some think uh, because we don't even we wouldn't all recognize the queen, apparently. If we were there, I don't, I think I would, I at least assume I would, but you never know. You never know until you're put in that situation. Uh, Tom Brady will host a, a show on Sirius XM along with Larry Fitzgerald. This is going to be a one hour a week talk show called Let's Go. Uh, they will have some other hosts on it. Of course, both players are still active professionals in the NFL. So one of the conversations will be how their teams and, and their own experiences are going. And then they will go ahead and branch out and talk about everything else going on around the league. Uh, according to the the people behind the show, Tom and Larry are generational talents, two of the best to ever play the game. We couldn't be more excited to have them on their own show, talking directly to listeners. Uh, this is tremendously odd, to, and it's not terribly unique, right? I mean, like a lot of high-profile athletes do regular appearances all across the, the dial, everywhere you go. Uh, but to have your own show and to be expected to weigh in as a as a talking head, essentially, on other things going on around the league, it would make interactions with him even stranger. If you were someone else playing in the NFL right now and you come across Tom Brady and or Larry Fitzgerald this season, I imagine the way you behave around them is the same way you talk to any sideline reporter for another another group. You'd be like, yeah, man, I'm everything's going great. Don't ask me any questions. I I would like to leave now. You You would be much different 
And I wonder if even the players on the teams they play on will start to feel a little bit uncomfortable or differently about this kind of thing. And it, it's not terribly unique, to be honest. There's a lot of other places in the world, I think, where you could find uh, athletes doing something somewhat similar uh, while still playing sports. But this is fairly high-profile people, uh, one of which, of course, uh, playing in their 22nd season in the NFL and Tom Brady. And it, it's I wonder also if you play poorly, if people would start to blame the side gig. And I don't know if we have enough conversations about that. Probably we do. Uh, but tremendously interesting to me. And I don't know if this is the start of something. We're also, you will now see this all the time. Why don't we just mic the players on the field and just have them do their own radio show or talk show or whatever it is. Only step left in all of this. Uh, one other quick one. An expert has revealed the best ways to get past procrastination. If you feel as though you're someone that struggles with procrastination a lot, it's the same sort of advice we've gotten time and again. Uh, make a list, take things one step at a time, have controlled motivation be a part of the equation, uh, which I liked a lot. Find ways to to focus your attention span and also give yourself maybe rewards if need be. Uh, this can be a lot of external forces, they say. Uh, create deadlines for yourself on things. I don't know if any of this really helps me at all. And uh, make sure that if you're doing something, that you do it, the, I guess, the best you can while you're working on it. These are things to get you through procrastination. I This advice is just like throw stuff at a wall and see what sticks, I, I think. I think it's just cycled, uh, recycled advice that we get every so often. And the latest one, I think the New York Times actually wrote this story, and it's a motivational researcher out of the University of Toronto who gave the tips. And I don't know how much I trust that person at all or that job. How do you get the job of being a motivational researcher in general, how do you dive into that world? Uh, it does say, though, that Netflix and snacking are things you can use to break up your day, but you can't have it be the entirety of your day. You're just going to keep procrastinating more and more and more. Uh, real quick, I think this is a side note. I tremendously have to recommend a TV show out there in the world uh, right now. Ted Lasso is a fantastic show. It's on Apple's television product, uh, Apple's streaming service, because there's just so many streaming services out there right now. You got to pick and choose all of them. Uh, but I saw a lot of people talking about it. It is uh, somehow connected to soccer, too, which makes me feel more like I care about things that are <laughs> that are not the most popular of sports all the time in the United States, but in some ways should be. Uh, Ted Lasso is is uh, a very good show, in my opinion, and one you definitely can check out if you want to procrastinate a little bit. That might be the road to go to not listen to this advice from this guy. Got to take a break. A lot more in a bit. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in, trying very hard to find you topics of conversation that don't have anything to do with coronavirus, the vaccine, or something else uh, connected to the ongoing, unfortunately still ongoing, uh, pandemic that is talked about all the time in this country. Very hard to do. Uh, however, I do think that this audio is interesting. Uh, it is on topic. Uh, for what I'm trying to get away from. But ABC News political director Rick Klein said that the messaging has been confusing and that that is indeed a problem, no matter what the excuse is, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, being locked down, not being locked down, all that stuff has been very back and forth. And the American people are just ready to be done, even if I guess uh, uh, some are saying that, you know, uh, the rising cases and whatnot means we can't be. A lot of us are definitely ready to be done. Here's the here's Rick. Where you need national unity or some consensus about what kind of signs, what kind of signals you're going to follow. And you really have the opposite. And look, you can blame the virus for being confusing and for adjusting. Yep. But at this stage, you don't have a reservoir of goodwill that the Biden administration has been able to build up because there's been conflicting information. There's been conflicting advice. The science has been changing. We don't know what zone we're living in or what the mandate's going to be for indoors versus outdoors, vaccinated, unvaccinated. People want their lives back. And Joe Biden told us just a few weeks ago, told the American people that we were about there. We were getting our lives back. Now we're seeing this backslide. We're seeing his uh, his advice adjusting. And, and it is confusing. It is. It is confusing. I feel like uh, he has to really try very hard to justify that, even on the show he's on, uh, which does tend to, to report a little bit more fairly than some. 
Uh, but it's just very interesting to me uh, that that conversation actually does uh, become an argument with some people because it's, it's just very true. Australia has been deploying helicopters and soldiers to order people to go home in one of the strictest places that still is dealing with a COVID lockdown of its own. Uh, these are the kind of things that us as Americans in our country just assume would never happen and could never happen. And in some ways are the kind of things that those who are fighting against whatever restrictions are in place at all are, are most fearful of. And that's why this, this becomes an argument becomes a conversation of any kind. The government is also uh, finding people who break the rules as far as going out. I think it's about 500 bucks is the fine. If you wind up out for a reason, you're not allowed to be out for uh, so just very interesting to do a quick search of other places in the world and how they're handling certain things. Uh, on to the Olympics, which, of course, the Olympics can't be tied to politics, can't be tied to, to any of the things that we talk about all the time. Uh, no, not the case at all. And it's honestly their fault. I, I will blame the U.S. women's soccer team for this uh, a lot more than what most people are doing, which is blame uh, those who are, are criticizing them right now. Because if you do take a stand on anything in this country, and the reason that sports for so long were apolitical is that you will alienate people that are supposed to be cheering for you. Now, I I understand that it's the Olympics and that we all come from the same country and we should be cheering for, not against, the United States of America, Uh, but there have been several members of this U.S. women's soccer team who have not shied away from opinion, and the opinion has been in ways political. They kneel, essentially, as one of many things they do as a sign of of taking a stand within their sport, well, they they lost. And a lot of people are going to social media, people who disagree with their politics, uh, high-profile people, Ben Shapiro, one of the ones being quoted a lot is saying, they're still the champions of kneeling, though, which is the important thing. And uh, some are saying that this is anti-American. Some are saying that this is awful and terrible and shouldn't happen. And I'm just saying it makes sense. I'm just saying that uh, not necessarily should it or shouldn't it occur, But this is the drawback of putting your opinions out there in the world in the first place and then going and playing a sport that you want people to care about. (laughs) That's that's how it works. Uh, If you see the disastrous ratings for these Olympics in general, you do wonder if a part of that could be tied to, you know, potentially maybe the anti-American sentiment that exists in some of these conversations. The the way in which certain Olympics, even leading up to the Olympics, there were high profile stories of Olympians who didn't really feel proud of the country that they were going to go there and represent and said critical things about it. I couldn't think of a better sport, by the way, a better sporting event, I should say, to throw all of those different components of what sports is into the same, same bucket of conversation and have us all react, you know, intriguing ways because to go support your country, to go uh, uh, play for your country and try to win for your country assumes that a majority of people who we send over there are proud of where they're from. And when they're not, that adds a weird layer to this. I guess to play a sport within our country, whether it's to be a high-profile basketball player or football player or whatever it is, in those situations, I guess the assumption that you're happy to be here might be a little different. But in the world of the Olympics, it becomes even more important. Uh, but the the ratings have just been awful, awful, awful for NBC uh, obviously, as far as the money goes for the the home country, for everything going on, they're losing so much money, not having any fans in the stands. Of course, even high-profile athletes like Simone Biles not competing in events doesn't help with any of those ratings. But the ratings have been down about 40% from the previous summer games of 2016, and they've lost more than half of the audience from the 2012 games in London. Uh, much of the collapse is connected to maybe a delay of a year. And as I said, some of the things that are probably less easy to, to prove for sure. Uh, they also say here that there are no no true superstars outside of the the one I mentioned. The, the men's basketball team, which has been playing better, is one of the other biggest stars uh, in every single Summer Olympics. The NBA players that we send to go play basketball abroad. And yet, as I just said, the NBA is another sport uh, another you know organization that has had a lot of political opinions <laughs> recently, and their athletes seem very comfortable saying some things certain ways, and then also being very friendly to China, which is which is also odd. And I think another reason that maybe a lot of viewers, a lot of people that pay attention to these kind of things, start to want to tune out is that it also seems like you're picking and choosing 
what kind of things you do support based on what does benefit you. Uh, and that's such an interesting way to think about that, right? Because the assumption is that China would not be tolerant to anti-Chinese sentiment, that they would not accept it, and that their products would do worse in China because high-profile athletes said things that China is not happy with. And also, of course, their government there could just ban some stuff. So those are the challenges. And yet those same athletes are completely comfortable saying things that might alienate the audience here and then they're very confused when this sort of stuff happens. And I, I do think a lot of the the reactions online right now to the to the celebration of the women's soccer team losing and saying how like that's anti American are sort of missing the idea that that to an extent this is a, a unforced error in the world of, as I said, talking about these kind of things again and again. Uh, in other news, Apple removed an anti vaccine dating app from its web from its web store. The dating app was called Unjected. Uh, This is a real... (laughs) Okay, hold on, I need a second. This is a real dating app, and it was designed to connect communities, and this is happening in a lot of the dating apps right now. They're trying to to focus their their potential uh, matches to a smaller and smaller subset of people. This does seem like an interesting way to connect a certain portion of the community together, uh, the community that is unvaccinated, Apple said that it was inappropriate because it inappropriately refers to the COVID-19 pandemic in its concept or theme uh, and decided to take it down, said that it was breaking rules. A lot of people are saying they don't understand what rule it was breaking, that that people who didn't want to get the vaccine and wanted to date other people who didn't want to get the vaccine is not necessarily making a statement beyond uh, just acknowledging the existence of those individuals. And Apple apparently is not not happy with it at all. Uh, we're too, we're considered too much for sharing our medical autonomy and freedom of choice. That was the founder of Unjected, uh, she said in an interview that went viral on on Instagram. So of course Apple has removed us. Uh, the app might be uh, trying to get on other app stores, or it might still be available for those that have other kinds of devices, and not Apple devices. But how interesting! to decide that, no, you're not a part of this. We, You can't date each other and have an app on our platform because this is somehow breaking our standards, even though it's not actually telling people not to get vaccinated, by the way. It's just connecting those who aren't, uh, which I found tremendously interesting. And there are, as I said, a lot of dating apps that try to get a very small niche amount of people together and not just have anybody who's single. That's something that's happening a lot. And this one probably could have been more successful if Apple wasn't willing to go right after it. I got to take a break. A lot more coming up. This is Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Don't let the Washington Beltway strangle you. This is where the exhausted majority comes to refuel, realign, and reevaluate. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Portland, Oregon cannot find police for their unit to fight rising murder cases, uh, murder and crime, uh, violent crime in the area. Portland's gun violence reduction team, which was shut down at one point last year amid the the calls for uh, redu- reductions in police budgets, the defund the police movement, has yet to find anyone to assign to that team now. Uh, they're demonizing and vilifying you, and then they want you to put in a, to be put on a unit that they're going to have a big microscope on. That's what's one of the head of a union uh, in Portland said. Absolutely true. Absolutely true that as we talk about that conversation, I may be not enough, uh, certainly not enough probably, on a day-to-day basis with other focuses that we have right now, and that homicide rates are, are skyrocketing in some areas. They rose 24% in a sample of 32 American cities in the first quarter of 2021. Homicide rates alone, this isn't all violent crime, 24% up in just the first quarter uh, in 32 American cities, in the totality of 32 cities. That's, that's fear-inducing to say the very least. And then you have cops that don't even want to be a part of the teams that are most uh, essential to combating that sort of thing because of a potential one, maybe even misinterpreted moment could go viral and could get you in a, a deep amount of trouble. And I'm not saying that all of them are misinterpreted. I want to be very clear, 
Uh, I'm just saying, as I've said before, that cops have a job to do that is designed to not be news at all. If they do their job well, whatever they're reporting to, whatever happens and occurs uh, in the world. Actually, there, there's a story out of Illinois uh, recently about cops showing up to a a confrontation. The person who was essentially the cause of the, the fight, firing at the police officers, firing his gun, his weapon at the police, they did not return fire to him, uh, and they did apprehend him without anyone getting injured in the incident. That is barely a news story. And the only reason I know about it is because I live relatively close to the place in Illinois where it occurred. Um, but it is, it's a news story that's going to be a blip and you miss it on the radar kind of thing. And that happens every day in so many places throughout our country. And that doesn't add any kind of you know high-profile uh, nature to the people who are serving on the police for nothing is discussed at all. And then the the few and far between examples of something different happening are the ones that are discussed and acted as though they're all that's happening with the police force every day. Anytime you see that viral conversation and the assumption is that all interactions with police are just like this, we tremendously misunderestimate how many interactions the police have in our society, like treme- ridiculously so underestimate the way in which this happens uh, in a variety of different ways every single day. Big Mac rat has gone viral. Uh, Big Mac rat is the newest version of a of a rat that decides that his safety or whatever is less important than getting food. Uh, I guess this happened on a UK highway. Uh, he The rat was dragging an entire Big Mac box across the street, which is fantastic. Uh, dodging cars essentially like the video game Frogger. It is a now viral video that a trucker captured uh, who only identified himself as Chris and said that he was really cheering for Big Mac Rat, who was just trying to do his best to get, I don't know if he's got other, you know, rats in the family that he's trying to feed too. A Big Mac feels like a lot of food for one, uh, but certainly it connected to a lot of the the people that remember the Pizza Rat, the legendary Pizza Rat in New York, and other similar different situations. These are the kind of stories that I like when the internet has, uh, and I like to connect more to that. I also saw that, I thought this was interesting, and technically, I guess, going back to Olympic news for a second, an Olympic athlete for the United States, Caleb Dressel, uh, who won several gold medals, I think it was five, at this very Olympics, said that he's kind of done with swimming at the end of winning, it, winning his fifth race. Uh, he said that he was pretty over swimming specifically. He also said this is not easy, not an easy week at all. Some parts were extremely enjoyable. I would say the majority of them were not. This is me quoting Caleb. Uh, you can't sleep right. You can't nap shaking all the time. I probably lost 10 pounds. I'm going to weigh myself and eat some food when I get back. It's a lot of stress we put on our body. You know what's even more intriguing to me than that uh, sentiment from a person that won a whole bunch of medals, gold medals at the Olympics? This is the idea. Like This is maybe the reason that the Olympics are hard on the athletes themselves. Maybe they're less interesting to the audience. You work your whole life understanding that at some point your skill set, if you're good enough, is going to send you to an event that the entire world competes at, and you're going to try to beat the world and win a medal, a gold medal, and be the best on the planet in a way that's unique from our, our sports that exist in this, in this country where we say they're world champions, but in some ways they're not necessarily. And then there's no one in the, fans to, in the stands to cheer you on. There's no fans. That moment should be the most celebrated moment of your life. The first time you win a gold medal, if you've worked your entire life toward that moment. And so for someone to do so well at an Olympics and just be like, yeah, I'm hanging it up. This is uh, it's over now. I don't care anymore. And I did not have a fun time. It means that you do at the end of the day, want to experience that, that satisfying version of doing something at that level to that degree where the win happens and there are people there to applaud, to cheer you on. It is such a shame that there are no fans in the stands at the Olympics. And a huge reason, I think, that we're having so many stories emerge out of the Olympics where the athletes themselves are barely happy uh, to be there at all. It's, it's eerie. It's weird to compete in these kind of things where it's just essentially silent crowds and nothing. You win a gold medal and no one's really going nuts for you. I get why that would be the kind of thing that makes you go, you know what, I'm done. I've worked my whole life for this. I've tried as hard as I possibly can to get to this stage. And then I just beat a bunch of other people who did the exact same thing with their whole lives. I was the best of the best. And it just felt completely like a, it that would be more disappointing 
than the ending to any kind of movie uh, that's not necessarily as good as you hope it would be or a TV show, any of that stuff. I mean, this would be probably something I personally would would feel just the same as as though, you know, what's what's really the point in doing this if there's no no true end celebration for it? I guess we need some kind of ridiculous parade here in the States, a multi-state parade uh, to celebrate all the athletes, to celebrate all their accomplishments uh, when they get back here to at least cheer them on a little bit in some way, shape, or form. Come on, guys. Uh, we need this as much as we can. Got to get out of here. Quick break. A lot more in a bit. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Lots and lots to get to, and yet it feels like the same topic is the only one that needs to be talked about, the only one that is getting talked about today uh, again and again and again. Uh, I do think this is interesting as far as mask mandates, coronavirus, and all that stuff goes. Uh, the mayor of D.C. reinstituted a mask mandate in the city and then was caught immediately after in a photo where she's at an event and not wearing a mask, which I find tremendously entertaining, uh, to say the very least. This is after having a party for a birthday celebration right before instituting the mask mandate that would not have been allowed with the new requirements. The mayor did say on social media that the uh, wedding was an outdoor rooftop ceremony and that it was followed by an indoor dinner reception. Uh, The mayor wore a mask at all times indoor in compliance with the new mandate that was thrown out there. Photos don't seem to demonstrate that to be true. Uh, But my favorite part in all of this is CNN doing the best job it possibly can to understand the moment and to say, well, maybe it makes sense. Maybe there's some argument to what she was saying. Maybe she didn't really break the rule at all. It demonstrates how ridiculous... Uh, news can be every so often when it's uh, partial, when it when the job, when you wake up in the morning is how am I going to further a narrative specifically, a narrative that I need to further. You then do everything you can when you're not being helped by those on the political team you're on uh, to make sure that you're still you're still helping the team along. Uh, here is that demonstration. She wasn't actually, as far as we know, violating the new rules, correct? I think that that is fair to say, but I think it it might also be about is she violating the spirit of it? I don't know. What do you think? I get it. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I, it's it's hard for me to remember. <laughs> I love that. I don't know. What, what do you think? What do you is she did she do anything that could be bad at all? Maybe could she have? Uh, what do you think? I don't know. I'm not sure that she did. What about you? I love the volleyball back and forth. Remember what we're all supposed to be angry about because it wasn't that long ago. We were criticizing politicians for wearing masks still where the science was telling them. The other team's the bad guy is where we've transitioned in the conversation. No, they didn't need to be. You know, we kept on asking the White House, why is Joe Biden still wearing a mask when the mask guidance, you know, has changed? And now, of course, we're saying she should be wearing a mask even though she was still following the guidance. Look, I, I get it. If you're a politician, you don't want a picture that raises questions. That's bad politics. The question is you know, whether or not she did anything functionally (laughs) policy wise wrong. And I don't know. I mean, I I guess it really depends on if she was. Okay. I gotta, I gotta stop it again. And this might not be as entertaining to most people out there as it is to me. And I cannot help finding this hilarious because as they're saying these things that are so understanding of the nuance of the moment, you remember all the times they burst through any sort of idea of nuance and blame, 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 and fight when it's the other side of the aisle, when it's a former president, Donald Trump, anything with even a modicum of appearance of bad is absolutely talked about as if he committed major crime. No better story exists to demonstrate that point than the Manhattan uh, investigation and the district attorney and all the different charges and things that that were coming, that were all going to be tied to the current president of the United States. All of those conversations, every single one, a, a legal expert would jump on a TV somewhere, even places like CNN, 
and say, you know, I doubt that this ever gets all the way to the, the former president. I doubt that Trump himself is ever in trouble, even if the Trump company uh, winds up facing charges of some kind or some of the employees like a CFO uh, wind up in some kind of trouble. I don't think that he's in trouble. And that is just ignored. The media is like, shh, 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 stop. Don't say those things. We have an optics that honestly. All right. About to do the hottest take. Uh, my hottest take today, I guess, and then we'll move on to other things. So sit down, prepare. Part of the investigation, part of everything going on with the January 6th commission is obsessed with optics. It's not obsessed with finding fact. Democrats are obsessed with the idea that if they put out the worst possible emotional version of an argument, the the most, you know, uh, captivating and one that will hit you on the, the feels level <laughs> and only that level, that they will win in the world of voting public opinion and contain continue to retain power in whatever places they have power. Their argument is always, let's captivate you with emotion and reason be darned. Uh, it's the optics. They're, they're obsessed with optics all the time. And this January 6th commission, uh, this January 6th investigation, putting people like Liz Cheney as the, the prominent Republicans on it and investigating whether, and then actually getting officers to testify and talk about the emotion of defending the Capitol on a day that some people didn't really want to listen and didn't want the Capitol defended. And and yes, there were deaths, although when people say deadly, I think that they're exaggerating even a portion of that. But yes, people did die. Uh, every part of that occurred. It's just obsessed with the optics of it. And I've said before that if you brought any police officer that's ever had to deal with any fight of any kind, any anywhere, you could do this with like a sporting event. You could interview a cop that had something bad happen when they were responding to rioting and looting after a, a team wins a championship of some kind, and they would probably have a similar reaction. I didn't expect it to get this bad. I never expected people to get this this angry or aggressive in that situation. We were all just trying to celebrate the insert team here championship. You could do that right now with any of the big cities in the in the country that are having this ridiculous amount of uptick in violence. You could bring any of those cops into a room like the one they brought the the other cops into, ask them what their experience was like dealing with violence on the streets. They tell you the same thing. That's why a cop's job is hard, by the way. That's why that's a job that we should all acknowledge is, and and it wouldn't paint any picture beyond the fact that the cop's job is hard and they, they dealt with someone who was intent on committing a crime. But that person doesn't speak for everybody else. Uh, we never do that in any other circles, by the way. If the violence or what whatnot is not tied to politics specifically, uh, we don't then say that everyone you know who thinks like this one person is probably just as guilty of the crime as this one person is. We don't do that. In other, we're actually yelled at doing that in a lot of ways because we're accused of that being racist or whatever uh, uh, group it might be that you think it is. It's actually the exact opposite is fought. But in the case of these these capital investigations and whatnot, it becomes the uh, one eighty degree turn. In logic, where you're saying, well, all Trump supporters are these people. Every, every single person who voted for any kind of Republican is truly the same as someone who was intent on committing a crime that day. And actually, as I talk about this story and immediately get more uh, disappointed, I, I see this uh, article, too, that 40 percent uh, down. Uh, there's a 40 percent decrease in the amount of people who believe that the situation is going to get better as far as uh, America and the fight against COVID-19. Optimism is at an all-time low again. Uh, it has been rising for quite some time. It was up to 89% at one point, and now it's all the way down to 45%. I guess I shouldn't say all-time low. If we're going back to, for this year, this is the lowest it's been. But last year, the start of the pandemic, there were times that American optimism was down in the 19 to 15% uh, kind of uh, lingering in that world. But we're we're blazing toward that again. And one of the biggest things is that 19 people say the practice of strict social distancing guidelines uh, has has gotten worse that the the mask implementation that the rise in COVID K all of these things are making more and more of us just disappointed, depressed, or fill in the right word for you. And it, it's it's so interesting to then think that all of our our differences are getting inflamed. You know, one other thing I will say about Matt Damon, and this is not tied to the to the news story he's in where where he admitted a thing, and now people are very upset with him about what he admitted. Uh, this is actually about him talking about the role in the movie he's in. Uh, he said that his role challenged him to think different politically, that he is someone who's always had certain political opinions, and that this role in this movie, Stillwater, uh, challenged him to hang out with, get to know, and then actually 
portray a person who doesn't agree with him politically. And it, quote unquote, opened his eyes to how similar people are, to how close our our differences are and how they're not widespread. And, you know, we're not all in our corners in the craziest of ways just because he had to challenge his brain to do something that any high school debate person would tell you is a good thing to do. Argue the other side. Do it every so often. Do it just for your own mental benefit. And that's why you shouldn't block people in social media. Man, I'm so soapboxy right now. I'm going to break in a second, but this is the soapbox of the day. You shouldn't block people on social media who disagree with you. You shouldn't do any of these things because you need those other opinions to be somewhere in your brain to make sure you're making the right uh, decisions and feel your opinions are best. And we just see this repeat again and again where we're so entrenched in our sides now and so filled with other people who agree with us and, and just, you know, prop up our own thoughts the same way that that's all we do. And then when we encounter encounter someone who disagrees with us, we treat them like they're actually a terrible person as opposed to just different, which is also insane, right? Anytime you interact with anybody that thinks differently than you, to treat them as though they're the enemy is actually a part of the problem. I got to take a break. I promise I'm putting away the soapbox after this. Quick break. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. No fake outrage here. Just the real thing. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Uh, first, an interesting story in the world of, uh, I guess, in the world of lottos. And then another story that's not necessarily tied to all the... These are two lottery stories, what I'm trying to say. Uh, the first one, somebody won one of those uh, lotteries for getting a vaccine. Uh, this person in Maryland, uh, which gave away $2 million in lottery prizes, uh, interviewed someone who won one of the big prizes. And they said that they were totally motivated by the lottery itself, that it was a huge motivator and it helped them get a vaccine and then win a bunch of money. Uh, This is not studied to be true. Uh, For the most part, a lot of people do not change their mind based on a big giant and a small percentage chance to win said big big giant reward. Actually, a lot of data is saying that just give somebody a little something, something, and they'll be, and I don't mean that dirty, I mean anything, like a hundred bucks, a free beer, something, you're more likely to get people to get the vaccine uh, based on that. And I have been amused when someone won in some of these states that have these lottos and then said it had nothing to do with the fact that they could win a prize because that's not the right. That's you can't you got to push that deep down. You got to say it again and do it the other way so that more people go get vaccinated. Now, the other lottery story is a woman out of Missouri who missed a flight. She had a flight get canceled. Uh, she was in Florida and she said that she unexpectedly wasn't able to fly. And so she bought a scratcher lottery ticket and won a million dollars. That would be the best prize ever for having your, your flight canceled or your flight delayed and being like, man, I gotta, I gotta just spend a little bit of time here at the airport. Let me go buy a lottery ticket. It's 790,000 as a lump sum payment. Um, You can't do that every day, but that would make you feel pretty, pretty good on the off chance. And that person probably said they're definitely going to fly again. Unlike the person who said maybe they will or won't get a vaccine. In other news, I saw this trending on social media. Uh, Something called the Devil's Bath exists in New Zealand. It is a neon green lake or or little like area of water uh, that you can, I guess, swim in safely. Uh, That's what some people are saying. It's near a volcano. It's a mixture of all different kinds of things that make it turn a certain color. Although actually, as I'm reading through this more, they're saying it might not be so safe to take a dip in the bath, but it is a very popular attraction. Uh, one that a lot of people migrate to all the time, and one that for whatever reason is getting more publicity right now as maybe a way to inoculate yourself. I'm not saying it's proven to be true. I'm just saying that people are looking for any and all remedies they can to to prevent the the horrible things that are this world, and so taking a dip in the devil's bath uh, might be a way to get a little bit further down the road uh, in your own mental process. It's not necessarily... I, I would love to have Fauci respond to that, though, you know? Just to ask a bunch of regular, normal questions, uh, questions that he's expecting, then be like, have you heard this story about the devil's bath? (laughs) I laugh at myself just thinking about the way in which he'd go through that. He would probably tell us that, you know, that's an attack on science because I'm attacking him and the devil's bath is terrible. Hardcore gamers uh, decided to keep playing video games while the uh, building they were in flooded. This was during a recent storm in the Philippines. Uh, The story was more viral last week. 
the we the reason I bring it up this week week is I also saw uh, a conversation about how video games may eventually be part of the Olympics. That whether we want it or not, the rise in profile that is video game playing and the way in which it's of so much interest to young people in so many different ways is that sooner or later uh, there will eventually be a time when an Olympic event involves sending over some gamers, and a lot of us are going to have feelings about how how inappropriate that may be, and that may further cater the ratings that are uh, the current Olympics, and they're struggling with that a lot. I will say this, though, and no one was harmed, I guess, even though there was a fear of an electric shock or a whole bunch of other things that could be a problem, but if you added additional physical challenges while playing the video games, I might eventually get there. If you had to do it in a in a giant you know thing of water, I guess, is one. If you had to do it while potentially being attacked by maybe an animal of some kind, there's a lot of ways that I could eventually be convinced that Olympics plus something else uh, gets us to the point where it makes more sense to me, but I don't know if we're right there. Yeah, I just thought it was so interesting that these kids are so addicted to video games. They're like, ah, we'll be fine. We will, it'll be okay. We're not going to, we're not going to worry that much about any of this. We're just going to keep barreling right toward it. And, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's not going to not gonna impact us all that much. Um, in other news, there's several other stories out there in the world that I guess aren't, aren't, I'm, I'm so obsessed by the Olympics though. I'm so intrigued by so many aspects of just the story beyond the Olympics. Simone Biles will be competing in one of the events. Now, uh, she will be trying to, to, I guess, leave the Olympics as a competitor in at least the the beam finals, uh, women's balance beam. Uh, that is a final that takes place relatively soon. Uh, she had withdrawn from all the other Olympic Games. And I'm just, I'm so intrigued what the narrative will be if Simone wins that event and if she doesn't win that event. And I don't know why, and, and they've said this about the Olympics themselves and the, the lack of pull uh, for many people to go watch is there's no stars. There's no huge, well-known athletes in this. And Simone Biles might have been one of the only exceptions to that narrative, and she did not compete. And a lot of people had a lot of a lot of takes and feelings about the reasons why, about the mental health aspect, component, conversation, whatnot. But I'm now more intrigued with this and what the end goal uh, is going to be or the end conversation. Are we going to say that she triumphed over adversity if she wins in this final event? If she doesn't win in the final event, is there going to be judgment a certain way? I can't, I can't help but wonder. Um, and then I also connected back again to the video game story. You'd never, you'd never have that in the world of video games, by the way. Maybe that's one reason that the Olympics are special uh, and not yet necessarily tied to these other things. You're never going to have somebody get that challenge, I think, in the world of video game playing and have to deal with this uh, uh, up and down kind of version of, of a conversation in so many different ways. I don't know, but it's, it's out there. Uh, pizza for your UK. Uh, pizza for your shot is actually one other thing in the UK, excuse me. Uh, in order to target young people to get them vaccinated, as I said a moment ago, a smaller prize seems to be as interesting as a larger prize. Uh, the UK will now be giving people free pizza delivery from a specific service there. And they hope that just that is like, hey, look at this. You got a reward of any kind. It's not millions of dollars, but you're going to get a, a pizza. It's I guess they now equate getting the vaccine to helping your friend move. You know, <laughs> you got to carry boxes. You got to spend a day here or you're going to get some free pizza, maybe a beer at the end of it. I do think this might actually work, though. I think there might be a lot of younger people who are encouraged by something that simplistic and decide, yeah, that's right for me. That's totally fine. I guess it now makes sense. I'll go ahead and get the vaccine. Although I would fight for more than just one pizza. If I can offer any advice to the young people of the UK, who I doubt listen to this, you got you to hold out a little longer. You got to negotiate for something beyond just a, a one-off, one large pizza move. Maybe get pizza for a week. Maybe get pizza a few times and or at least some drinks to go with it. Because you know it's always better if you get the the pizza with the twisty bread or that kind of... I just, I love this story though. And good luck to them on trying it out. All right, that's Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show.